Philip Robinson is a poet from the Boston area. He's anthologized in the Road Before Us Gay Black Poets in the Life of Black Gay Anthology When the Drama Club is Not Enough in the Last Closet, The Real Lives of Lesbian and Gay Teachers in Life in Our Own Words. Philip is the recipient of the Audre Lord Award for Poetry uh, presented by the Greater Boston Lesbian Gay Political Alliance and a 1995 Hometown Video Festival winner. He's been awarded the Boston City Council Proclamation for AIDS Action Committee Volunteer Recognition Award for the World AIDS Day, Multicultural AIDS Coalition's Joseph Cardozo Education Award, Boston Gay Alliance of Gay and Lesbian Youth Service Award, the Visionary Award, Black Pride, New England Community Warrior Award for Courage, the Massachusetts State House Representative Proclamation Comprehensive School Age Parenting Program, the Big Sister Service Recognition Award, and most recently AIDS Action Committee's 25th Year Recognition Award. I came across um, a, a quote, let's see if I can find, that was in a website and it had beautiful words uh, by Philip also about his work. I might have to read it at the end, I think, but you get the idea. He has written and published two books of poetry, including Secret Passages, a Trilogy of Thought, and We Still Leave a Legacy, which is now in its fourth printing. His forthcoming book of poetry is titled In the Trenches, The Voice of a Guidance Counselor, because Philip is retired after 32 years of working for the city of Boston in the Boston Public Schools. He lives in West Roxbury with his life partner of 35 years, Joseph Jackson, also a retired Boston Public School teacher of 35 years. And he's here to share some of his poetry, which is in a form activism with us today. So please give a warm welcome to Philip Robinson. <laughs> All right, how are we doing for now? <laughs> We're doing well. Thank you and good morning. I'm, I'm very honored to be here this morning and I thank Cheryl for um, the invitation. I look forward to this. This morning I'm gonna read some excerpts from the books she spoke of, We Still Leave a Legacy, as well as my forthcoming book, In the Trenches, The Voice of a Guidance Counselor. Um, I just wanna say too in the onset that let us all continue to be the light for each other because we need that more than ever and as my friend Steve said to me in a text just last night, we do need the arts to keep us all kind of activated and alive. This first poem is called Camille. I am beautiful no matter what they say. Words can't bring me down. But they did for Camille so much so that she stayed home from school, got sick, so began her spiral descent into failure. Camille wrestled with the question of whether she'd be better off dead. The taunts from the other students, their lies and even threats, were all eating away at her soul. She felt her sense of hope being destroyed. Yet by American standards of beauty, Camille is a knockout. Other girls envied her chiseled cheekbones and long flowing hair. She also had that Coca-Cola body. The Commodore song, Brick House, comes to mind. Camille couldn't see her own beauty and didn't believe in herself. It was as if her mirror needed to be fixed so Camille could see the strength of her inner spirit. But to Camille's credit, she went to the mentoring program to begin the healing process. No point in her singing this song if she didn't believe in herself. Camille. In midst of the storm, it's a feeling I have whenever the weather decides to rain on my parade. You will cover me and I will walk a thousand more miles. It's a feeling that surrounds me when my doubts about other friendship shake my soul. I see the confidence in your eyes and in your effervescent and smile. I know your embrace strengthens my spirit Hey, I am renewed. I know it goes beyond this moment in that you have no qualms about telling me your love will never cease. So I say, bring on the storm in midst of the storm. Red Ribbon. The early morning chill made it a bit uncomfortable, but I roamed my house in hot pursuit from room to room. 
I was determined not to venture out without it. My search produced hidden treasures, not the ones I expected. I never started this particular day without one on. I would have appeared naked to myself. The ubiquitous red ribbon wasn't lost with me. Ah, I found one. Tears filled up in my eyes. I can now be dressed completely. I wore it as a constant reminder of the millions of lives lost from the lack of funded resources and the non-committal stance from people like President Reagan made and he who hardly ever uttered HIV AIDS personally contribute to some of these deaths. I had the red ribbon on my lapel this day. I walked throughout the school corridors and passed close to 500 people between students and staff and not anyone made an acknowledgement. I entered the nurse's office with the two nurses present and they looked at me in puzzlement. One even queried, why, we didn't know it was World AIDS Day. I left their office confused and hurt. 35 years this pandemic has been amongst us. 12th grader Shalita, a special ed student, diagnosed as developmentally delayed, sat quietly to cool off in the bathroom. In her previous class, she had had a meltdown. Oh, wow, she screamed when she saw me. I know about those red ribbons. They are for AIDS awareness. I hugged her. Ah, oh, Shalita had finally made my day. I stuck my chest out with the red ribbon and continued my day with pride. These are a few of my favorite things. When I stopped kissing my father. When I stopped kissing my father, roofs and ceilings fell hard upon my shoulders. In the middle of the floor, no one experienced the pain but me. Self-pity calls out for such recognition. Distance came between us as I carried my message to finding love to his now new embrace. Mommy couldn't wait for her kiss and hug combination, one without the other, an incomplete welcome. Daddy smiled as mom and I exchanged so much energy, it freed him up. Compensation stepped into spots never filled. No one knows how age and years begin to separate one from foundations built to shore one up. When I stopped kissing my father, his love seemed to fade. When I stopped kissing my father upon his requests, I couldn't ask for anything else. When I stopped kissing my father, love had a newer meaning called restriction. When I stopped. The hole within the lie that cried. In midst of her tears, Constant wiggled in the chair in the guidance counselor's office. Today is my brother's birthday and I really do miss him. He was the only one that I could ever talk to. Where is he? What happened to him? The counselor asked. He was murdered last month. Oh, how tragic, the guidance counselor said as he handed Constance some tissues. Yeah, my mother took down all his pictures and she won't even let us use his camera, something that he treasured. He was my rock. The guidance counselor, unable to contain his composure, started to weep as well. Later that month, sadder than the news Constant had previously shared, her mother confessed at a parent-teacher meeting there was never a brother or a murder. The guidance counselor had shed his last tears. What will Constance do now that the truth has been revealed? The gift. I would be nothing if I couldn't sing my song. When Johnny Mathis sings, it's like no one else I've ever heard. He sings so sweetly, even the birds listen. Chances are, I would give anything to hear Ella scat again or even sing her winning song. A tisket, a tasket, I sold my yellow basket. That voice of Donny Hathaway, wow. I could hear him proclaim, talking about the ghetto. 
which is still alive and well. Drugs fester and dreams die there every day. Did Donnie jump from the building so he could see the other side and return? I wish I could hear Judy Garland's rendition of Somewhere over the rainbow. Was it too far for her to believe it was there? I have nightly concerts of Lady Day serenading me. Them that Scott shall get, them that's not shall lose. So the Bible says, and it still is news. Many Ripperton sing, loving you is sweeter than a dream come true. Who can contest such a feeling? Marvin Gaye spoke of the injustices of what's going on and compelled us to question life. His own father, or was it God, shortened Martin's time on this earth. Phyllis Hyman, somewhere in my lifetime, and you know how to love me, didn't save her soul. Ah, oh, I wish I could hear those voices again. <clears throat> Impunity. The killing of one is like the killing of all mankind, Quran. No one can't say stuff won't happen. Death is inevitable, be it by a bullet or two, terminal illness or age, or just sitting yourself in a wheelchair. Yes, a wheelchair. Three policemen ranged in weight from 203 to 210 pounds each thought this frail looking man had reached for his gun as he sat in his wheelchair. Don't they get trained? to tackle or taser someone first? Well, they fired bullets. One shot wasn't enough, and no weapon surfaced as this wheelchair man rolled dead to the ground. What happened at this point? Videos never lied. Now, what will the jury say? How invincible can they be? Ain't gonna study war no more, ain't gonna study war no more, ain't gonna study war no more. Duty bound. The students laughed and laughed. They hadn't given the slightest of a potential war an ounce of consideration. Man, you know we deal with many wars and Bin Laden characters right up here in our own backyard, Lamar, one of the students, proclaimed as he smiled around to his other classmates. The teacher backed off with other questions about whether weapon inspectors had found any weapons or was the disarmament done peacefully. Shouldn't they be concerned about the daily atrocities in Aleppo, Syria, Iraq? The teacher further pondered to herself. Hey, the way we see it, adults created these wars and frightened the hell out of young people into going into combat. We are right tired of this crap, Lamar again proclaimed. However, the teacher remained curious. Weren't any one of you young minds concerned about the rise of ISIS, unrelented attacks, and jihads were out to kill? Lamar chose his last statement. Listen, Miss McIntyre, will this information be on the MCAS exams? <laughs> hey, if it isn't, forget it. We'll just take our diplomas. The students laughed to rock the walls of the room. The dismissal bell rang. <clears throat> touch. Lost touch with my soul. I had nowhere to turn. I had nowhere to go. Lost sight of my dream. Thought it would be the end of me. I thought I'd never make it through. I had no hope to hold on to. I thought I would break. I didn't know my own strength. Whitney Houston. Arched and poised, Miss Jordan was decked out in her tailored black suit. And to set it off, she wore a single strand white pearl necklace. The invitees all took to their reserved spots. But Miss Jordan had gracefully arrived on time. After all, she had a prime seat. There were no fancy Easter hats in front of her to block her view. She sat on edge of her seat, attuned to each nuance to the service. You see, Miss Jordan knew she couldn't be there physically, so here she perched herself front and center in her own home, miles away, ready to be a part of this home going. In the beginning, the choir, all dressed in white, warmed up the audience. After you've done all that you can, after you've done all that you can. At the end of the services, the entire church stood. So did Miss Jordan. Who said Miss Jordan had to be right up in New Jersey? The sanctuary of God is in the hearts and souls. Singer, then speaker, each personal and poignant, created the emotional surge. 
The hands waved, tears flowed from the smallest to the oldest, a testament to the tremendous and universal loss they had experienced. When Whitney sang, we knew God also had spoken. In our lifetime, he gives us an opportunity to experience his presence through others. Whitney was one of God's disciples, you see. Through her music, definitive memories were created. Her songs made us dance. They lift our spirits and encourage our tears. Why can't each life have such a lasting impact? Whenever you have been blessed, it feels like heaven. You have to pass it on. Whitney knew and did exactly that. Two more. The Line Cross. In the call to teach, could Bill Conrad have heard, seek release for your desires, because he did. He introduced the subject with the enticement of better grades to students for private lessons, AKA services rendered. Some impressive students went in awe with his generosity. They fell victim to his assault. It proved hard not to have resisted a guaranteed boost to one's GPA. 12 years, 12 years after these violations of youth had taken place, Mr. Conrad, that revered English teacher, had been fired from his teaching job of 34 years. He had no interest in retirement. Apparently, his sexual predatory behavior kept his interest in teaching pronounced. Yet the students, victims, finally came forward to report the crimes made against them. They had gained the courage needed and their voices had returned. Did Mr. Conrad, acting upon his fantasies, let them outweigh his dedication to shape those minds? Hmm. He should have not confused the message when he was called. My last piece is taken from my book of poetry that's here today, called We Still Leave a Legacy. It's titled that way because I feel, as many of you might concur, you know, regardless of what happens, it's not the end of the world. I like that statement the other day that the outgoing President Obama said, it's not the end of the world. But we do stand on shoulders, and we walk shoulder to shoulder with each other. This was written out of the sense of giving homage to many people who go on too soon, but yet their legacy still lives. There's a place for us. Somewhere a place for us. Each death chisels away at my life. No other impact has entered as strongly. Now, no cries can go unheard. There is a newer purpose to these days. The aftermath tends to linger longer this time, allowing lives to be reassessed. We become more in touch with our own mortality. Revelations are meaningful timetables to this discovery. Those who die in silence often experience more pain. To bury one's dreams is to let go of life. Our larger mission is to complete tasks that have been left incomplete. Our greatest weapon against fear will be the collective intelligence and love will to us through our higher power. When the deepest of emotions have been put in check, we will have acquired the sense of touching and caring for ourselves sources of true deliverance. The enforced censorship of our private affairs will never censor my love, our love, or the movement. There are beams of hope and faith directing us, keeping our search infinite. This is one battle we will win. We have been handed the torch. Our march is for us, it is for them, it is forever. Thank you so much. Thank you, thank you, thank you. The, wor the words of, of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. continue to wake us up to the world around us. In 1959, in his commitment address to the Morehouse College, he cautioned the graduates not to sleep through a revolution. He believed that love was the only transforming redemptive power to improve the world, and that the concern for every man, every human being, was paramount. 
but the dignity he felt for the common man was found in his life's work, doing it well, regardless of what that job was. He said, if it falls to your lot to be a street sweeper, then sweep like Michelangelo painted pictures. Sweep like Shakespeare wrote poetry. Sweep like Beethoven composed music. Sweep, sweep streets so well that all the host of heaven and earth will give pause and say, here lived a great sweet street sweeper who swept his job well. I leave you with a poem not about a street sweeper, but about his brother, the ironing man, who lived in a desert country and who had a dream. His bent posture framed by the doorway, he sweeps desert's dust from his one room shop. The ironing, the ironing man labors over cloth, pressing at seams. His frayed galabea sways to the clip-clop of hooves, the flute man's trills, and the greetings of the day. Hand poised midair, he glimpses the floral fabric of a nubile girl. He grips rag around hot handle of the iron on its way back down to work. Iron meets cloth, wet cloth with a hiss. A bed of red coals flickers in the half light. He folds warm linen with a smile. He sees her again, delicate ankles, same floral dress. She stands at the fruit cellar across the narrow street. I must buy tangerines, he said, searching his pockets for coins. He hesitated mid-step. Chickens clucked their disapproval underfoot. Minaret calls. He closes the louvered doors and walks towards the mosque, lost in the color of his country. Thank you. My selection for today is the poem, Freedom. We live in a time of unparalleled personal freedom. Worse than it being suppressed is taking it for granted. We must always support and defend the voice of the people, even when its opinion steadfast opposes our own. There's evolution, pollution, and the Constitution. Healthcare, welfare, and warfare. Indiscretion, confession, and witness protection. Government spying and racial profiling. Greed and hypocrisy. And don't forget the iconic factories and warehouses, the truck stops and coffee shops of those that made, made in the USA. We interrupt this poem for a special announcement. Your manufacturing jobs have all been shipped overseas. We apologize for any inconvenience and want you to know it's nothing personal. Nothing personal. Flash forward to the censorship games. White out, leave out, blackout. Pixelization, politification, and propaganda. When all else fails, silence. When democracy is put to the test, Americans rise to the occasion, for they know the unscrupulous will always capitalize on the weakness of others. It's the word you've heard a thousand times before, from the Oval Office to the Senate floor, the supreme law of the land you can hold in your hand to take a stand without reprimand. Freedom is quite possibly the most powerful word in the world. And we carry that freedom so boldly on our American shoulders that it makes the stars and stripes a constant reminder to support and defend that freedom for those fortunate enough to have it, those who died in its honor, and those domestic and foreign whose dreams have yet to be realized that we never, 
ever forget them and what it truly means to be an American with freedom. Thank you. At the time of his death, Martin Luther King was very likely the most popular person in America. Having led the civil rights movement such great success, it was next focusing his attention on the peace movement. He had recently delivered a speech in which he strongly condemned the war in Vietnam. And he was working on another speech in which he would endorse Bobby Kennedy for president as Bobby Kennedy was running as an anti-war candidate. Martin was assassinated before he ever got to deliver that speech. Bobby Kennedy was himself assassinated shortly after. My poem today deals with the perils of spreading truth. It's called the Enlightenment Hotel. Down at the end of Godforsaken Street awaits the Enlightenment Hotel. We discover enlightenment to be a gamut of inconvenient truths, which you alone now know and must now share, that's the deal. Share with your contemporaries who intransigently fail to heed, despite the benevolence in your myth-busting, till your grit gets you through to them. And as their facade begins to crack, they cannot contain their trembling, leaving them no recourse but to crucify you. Thank you. Thank you.